Hey, this is Mike Spreiser from Devil Driver, and you're listening and watching Lini Rock. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so we can stop it. <clears throat> so I'm here today with Devil Driver. So welcome to Italy, first of all. Thank you. <laughs> this is Vivian speaking. Okay, so Mike, every single record of yours has been a progression. And you said about Pray for Villains that it was the defining sound of what you are. So I'm wondering, what about the new album, Beast? Well, we definitely wanted we wanted to take, uh, I think, the um, Fear of Our Maker's Hands and The Last Kind of Words were probably our most two similar sounding records. So when we did Pray for Villains, we wanted to, we kind of went in for a different approach and mm -hmm. wanted to change things up a little bit. It's a little bit more melodic. Um, there's songs like I've Been Sober that uh, have, you know, long intros and long solos and long grandiose endings and, and whatnot. And, uh, we didn't want to do Pray for Villains Part 2 mm. after uh, when we went in with Beast, so we, we purposely went and said, you know, let's not do what we did on Pray for Villains, let's do something, you know, just no bullshit, just straightforward, you know, brutality. In fact, it's your most brutal and like harshest I think so, yeah. Compared to, to the previous one, which was more experimental in a yeah. way. Mm -hmm. You said it's also, you defined it as versatile and volatile, so what do you mean by that? Uh, you're gonna have to ask Des about that. I believe those are his words. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so would you agree? Yes, I would. In some sort of way. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, it's also your last album to feature your your longtime bassist, uh, John Miller. Mm -hmm. And so, how is it to work and tour without him? How do you get along with uh, Aaron? He's he's been great. I mean, he was, he was he's our tour manager also, and we were just lucky enough where. You know, when John Miller was having his problems, he had to, uh, we were in Europe and we had to send him home twice. So luckily we had Aaron around to fill in and my uh, guitar tech, Dave Burke, he also uh, filled in for, you know, about half the set. So when we, when we first started using Aaron, he was playing half the set and Dave was using half the set. But um, unfortunately, John Miller didn't really contribute a whole lot to the last record. Um, myself and my drummer, John Burke, when we played, pretty much all the bass on that record. And I think there's only maybe one or two songs that John Miller wrote. So it's, we are, uh, they got that subwoofer going, don't they? <laughs> uh, Jesus. It's quite annoying. Yeah, isn't it? Um, oh. It's the live part of it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, they're testing the subwoofer. The subwoofer works, but uh, I mean, when we were in the studio already, we we were really trying to help and work with John Miller and try to get him more excited about music and stuff like that, but I think he was just done mm -hmm. with it, so even when we started touring with him again, it was already, we kind of noticed it was the beginning of the end with yeah. him, and uh, he needed some time on his own to work on his own issues and get things back together, but um, unfortunately, none of us really talked to him anymore. Oh, I see. And well, Beast was recorded at Sonic Ranch Studios in Texas and with producer Mark Lewis and then mixed by Andy Sneap in England. Yes. Uh, I know there are two main steps when producing the albums. So first off, uh, it's the first time round at your house. Yes. Then you pass the material on to Des to mm -hmm. do the lyrics and then to the real studio, we can say, to compare it with the producers. So um, tell me about these collaborations. How does it? Do you all conceive the album the same way, or do the producers add something new to the album that you hadn't thought of? They've, they've always. Um, I th it, it depends on the producer. I think uh, when we worked with Jason Sukoff and Mark Lewis on Last Kind of Words, they uh, there was a lot of influence on you know that they had musically and lyrically. I, I think Mark Lewis's approach uh, has, he has more of an influence on the music. He's a very, very good uh, guitar player. Mm -hmm. And he had an enormous influence on all the solos, to say. And uh, definitely, you know, pushed me and Jeff into a different direction. You know, I was like, dude, I can't play that. We'll go work on it for a while. And, you know, okay, okay. <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> um, you. I think, uh, I wasn't really in the studio a whole lot for the, the lyric, the, when Des was doing the vocals on the last two records, um, but uh, from what Des has told me, uh, Logan Vader had had a big, had a lot of good influence vocally on uh, Pray for Villains, and I would say he had a little bit less 
um, musically, but we had worked so, you know, we, we spent a lot of time writing the music for Pray for Villains, more than any other record. Mm. And so I think by the time we got to the studio, there wasn't really a whole lot to be said about music. I think it was, it was for the most part, like 80, 90% set in stone. I see. Well, Oscar Beast, it was more a, like a... Yeah, I think, uh, I think yeah, I from, from pre-production at my house in the studio, I'd say a lot more changed or um, musically because of Mark Lewis than what changed between my house and going in and doing pre films with mm -hmm. Logan Mayer. I see. And well, this time you decided to go back to the Sonic Ranch Studios. You said to keep the group's dynamics together because before you felt like uh, you were like producing separately. So do you prefer working all together with the group's dynamics? I prefer, work, I prefer working together. Mm. Um, when we did Trade for Villains, we did it at uh, Logan Manor Studio in, in Hollywood. And, you know, you, you have, it's a small studio. You can't really fit more than two or three people in there at a time. If you have three people in there, it's pretty tight. Mm. So we would come in and basically do our parts, mostly one-on-one -on -one with Logan. and. Uh, uh, so it wasn't really a big group dynamic, and I I like going to Sonic Ranch because you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're right next to the Mexican border, and uh, there's not really a whole lot to do out there other than just your concentrate on music, focus. yeah, and um, you know it just kind of brings the band together because um, if you get bored, the only the only people you can go to is your band. <laughs> yeah, so sure. It forces you together, and we all get along really well. And we enjoy each other's company, so we have, we have fun. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. You recorded 14 songs, and 12 of them made the standard version of the album, and then the two extras appearing in the special edition. So what was the criteria you adopted to do the sequencing, and to decide to keep those for the special edition? We just, it's kind of a group decision, you know, it's, you don't know which ones are going to make the record, and which ones are going to be side, or going to be on, you know, B-sides. Um, there was... The, uh, the cover that we did, uh, Black Soul Choir by 16 Horsepower, there was a lot of debate where um, actually one of the songs that were B-sides is one of the songs that I wrote, but um, a lot of people, including some people at Roadrunner, originally wanted Black Soul Choir to be um, on just the uh, special edition, and I didn't want that. I, I pushed pretty hard to get that, and eventually people, like, the more they listen to it, and a lot of people don't even know that that's a cover, because it's not a very, it's a country band. Mm. And, but uh, I think that song came out very well, and uh, that was, you know, one of the ones that <laughs> I personally had to fight a little bit to get on the record. Uh huh. I see. <laughs> and um, you said that this new album sits on in its own corner uh, from any other of your albums. So what's that corner? Um, was it conceived in that corner? Uh, what do you mean by corner? It was quite it, interesting to uh, to like find out what the corner is. I think it's. I mean, we did, like I said before, we went in to do this record and, you know, not repeat what we did on the previous one, which was more of a, almost more of a mellow approach, but very rare. I just sit, like for me personally, and I think the rest of the guys, we just sit down and write and then, you know, and just see what happens. Mm. I don't want to try to go in my channel, the record's going to be just like this, you know, I just kind of just let it come naturally. So I see. it's the fact that we got stuck in whatever corner that is, you know, it's, it just, it was more subconscious than conscious. So it comes after, like when it's done, the more you talk about yeah, it... Yeah, then you kind of see the final product yeah. and you go, oh, this is what we got. The more you, you talk know? about it, then the more you start realizing things yeah. whilst when you create it, it's actually... It yeah, you're, it, it, it's, you're not improving on the spot, but in, over the course of a year or whatever, you're just kind of like, you know, throwing different things in the mix and you say, well, this song fits the record and this song doesn't fit the record. I mean, there's songs on all of our records that we wrote for previous records. Mm that uh, you know, I always keep on my computer sure. at home and we'll uh, sometimes we'll say, yeah, hey, we'll, 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 and we'll be like, oh, dude, I completely forgot about that song. <laughs> yeah, it happens And then I'm like, let's work on that one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so let's go through some of the songs. Um, about Outpress, it's uh, about when you walk in the bus or backstage and you find people you have no idea who they are and they just are drinking your beer, smoking your stuff. So, um, does that happen a lot? Not regularly. I mean, uh -huh. it happens from time to time where you're just kind of like, who is this guy and why is he annoying me? <laughs> but uh, very rarely. I mean, most people are, I think, in the world are oh, okay. fairly respectful. Uh huh. 
Who and knows, I might have been that guy a couple times. <laughs> in other bands' dress rooms, taking their beer. I'm like, what the hell is this guy? That's not how I It's like, I, I don't know, but I'm taking your beer. <laughs> so let's link that to the next question, because I wanted to ask you about the documentary. You may know us from the stage. Mm -hmm. um, how real is that? I mean, compared to what really happens. Um, 100%. 100% real. That's so you really wanted to make it uh, to show people what really happens. Yes. Mm -hmm. And no, yeah, it's 100% real. That was five years in the making, and we, uh, I mean, you know, Des and I and the record label and the rest of the band went back and forth whether or not we wanted to include the wine bottle scene in France, but we got into a fight. But I mean, whenever we get into arguments, every band's going to get into arguments, and you know, it's just like it, it was 100% real, you know, on there. Like, we got into a fight and we literally made up probably an hour later. You know, it's just like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry too. It's <laughs> like, real life. Real yeah, life. I mean, you put a bunch of guys together, you put a little alcohol in the mix, and all the adrenaline from going up on stage with heavy metal music, you're bound to get into an argument from time to time. It, yeah. it happens, but what keeps the band together is compromise and be able to work things out and not be stubborn and just be like, I'm going to be pissed off at you for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, just like, put it aside and say fuck it and, you know, we're guys, we've got testosterone in us, sometimes we like watching each other get hurt and sometimes we got to beat each other up, you know, this is what guys do. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, what about bringing the fight to the floor? How was that song born? You know what, I didn't, uh... That's uh, a question for John Berklin, actually. I didn't have anything to do with that song. Okay. That was, uh, I think most of the music was written by John Berklin, and just a couple parts by Jeff Kendrick, and then Des wrote all the lyrics. And I can't really elaborate on the lyrics too much because Des had to leave the studio, mm. and um, he uh, had to move his family from one house to the other. And uh, so he, at a spur of the moment, something came up where he's just like, you know, he was renting a house, and uh, the people that owned it lost their house, they were living in like Colorado or something like that, and they asked Des if he could move out and move somewhere else so they could move back in. And uh, you know, he wanted to help them out, so he left the studio and we finished the music, and then he went in and finished the music, or the lyrics, with just him and Mark and, at uh, Tim's house from As I Lay Dying mm -hmm. near San Diego. So, um, frankly, I wasn't there for any of the, the lyrical process whatsoever. I see. Just the music. Which kind of bums me out. Hopefully, the next record, I'm gonna. We've all talked, and definitely want the whole band there for the yeah. the whole process. Yeah. Well, yeah, that'd be that'd be good. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but you know, things happen, things arise, and <laughs> you have to make it work. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, you're touring with Machine Head tonight, Bring Me the Horizon, and Dark Sour. So it's uh, like a quartet, a foursome that I know you're pretty happy about, because uh, you said you love touring in packages that offer a diversity of styles of metal. So what connections do you feel with these bands, and of course, what uh, differences? Well, I, I would say the biggest oddball on this tour is Bring Me the Horizon as far as not so much their music, but definitely their fan base. I mean, I've never seen so many like 13 to 15 year old girls in the front row waiting for them to go on. Um, but, which is a little weird because our, you know, most of our fans, I say, we're, are a little bit older. And, uh, but I think it's, it's kind of cool for us to play because I think we're getting exposed to a lot of people that normally wouldn't listen to Devil Driver and mm -hmm. hopefully, you know, we can, you know, convert them to the darker side of music you know, and become Devil Driver fans in the process. I'm sure we've snatched a few up here and there in the process, you know, <laughs> since we started the tour. And you mentioned in Machine Head's DVD Elegies, you mentioned them as a great influence. For you. Well, that actually wasn't me. That was uh, Jeff and John. I never, unfortunately, when I was growing up, I was all, I was the only person I knew that liked heavy metal. I didn't have a whole lot of friends that were into heavy metal. Most of them were into punk rock, or mm -hmm. um, a lot of them were actually into rap music. And I just, when I was a kid, I hated rap. I listen to a little bit of it now, but I couldn't stand it. And. Uh, um, but Jeff and John, they grew up together, and uh, you know, I just never got exposed to Machine Head until I met them. And I, when I met them, I was 18. And I, uh, but they've Jeff and John have been huge Machine Head fans. I mean, I think they even have pictures of them hanging out and waiting for them outside of their bus. No when they were way! Like 15. Another touring together. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, no, they're they're always happy to be out with Machine Head, and you know, Jeff is out there watching them almost every night. 
And I know that you said in a recent interview that you'd like in the future, you'd like in the future to play um, some other genres of music. So would punk rock be one? No, no, um, definitely no I not. I do listen to a few punk rock bands, and there is some stuff that I really like. But I'm more into industrial. Um, I've been kind of getting into trip hop a little bit mm -hmm. lately, and just I like electronic music. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, a big fan of 80s music like Depeche Mode and Duran Duran and Tears for Fears and things like that. Uh -huh. And uh, um, I haven't really done any projects yet that you know surround that type of music late, uh, recently, but I would like to kind of get away from metal for a little while. Mm. But not get away from metal, just do something else while I'm writing metal. I, li I, I don't think I'd want to play anything else than a heavy metal band. Even a heavy metal band is just fine. Even though I don't listen to a whole lot of the new metal bands that are out these days, it's just don't do it for me. I guess I'm just getting old. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, we'll see what the, the future holds. And Some experiments. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I want to. You know, not even if I'm not in the band, I'm just producing or mixing. You know, yeah. I don't like to do that. Yeah, I see. One last question about your website mm -hmm. uh, that you and Jeff did called AllAccess.com, right? Yes. So any news about that? Any? Well, actually, um, we've got a lot of new exciting stuff coming up. Um, we're going to be hosting uh, Willie Adler from Lamb of God's oh, uh, awesome. personal webpage, which should be up. Um, I was just talking to Jeff about this yesterday. I think it's planned on going live in about three weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking to a few other people. Um, I won't mention who. A couple people on this tour about doing the same thing. Uh, we just filmed, I believe, we just filmed uh, Chris and Michael from Arch Enemy, and I don't know if that's up on the site yet, I think it should be going up fairly soon. Uh, we just did filmed Evanescence and uh, their guitar players, and um, our business partner lives in London, mm -hmm. and uh, Jeff's little brother Andrew is actually, he's been doing some filming and editing for us. He's actually our main editor right now with all the videos, and he lives out in Boston. So it's it's kind of a nice mix, you know. When bands come through LA, where Jeff and I live, we we work with them. Or bands when we're out on tour, yeah. And then we got someone in Boston, and then we have someone in London also. So it's like we're always, you know, I mean, especially in London, there's just bands coming through there in LA constantly. Yeah. So there's yeah, there's gonna be a lot of cool stuff coming up. And then when I we have three months off after this, and. Um, you know, I have my own section on there called Gear Geek, where I just kind of just go through all my gear that I have and say what I like and what I don't like about it and how I use it. And I plan on doing a lot more filming for that when I get home. So we'll be waiting for that. Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.